Each year in late February, I come out to this Missouri wildlife refuge to study one of the most beautiful and least understood of American birds, the great blue heron. In the next few weeks, between one and 200 great blues will migrate here from the south to reclaim the remnants of last year's nest. In early March, the first males begin arriving. After a short period of wandering over the heronry, the males choose trees for nesting. The females will fly up later. Every year I've come here, there have always been more male herons than available nests. Consequently, the males compete for the nest, the best and highest nests going to the strongest and most aggressive males. To get a nest, the male must violate the territory of another male heron. The territory includes not only the branch he stands on, but the airspace around it. Trespassing often incites a pursuit flight to decide who gets the nest. This pre-mating competition for the available nests helps to make sure that the strongest and most fit males will reproduce young. The loser must try again, or start a new nest from scratch. By the end of March, all the nests have been taken by the strongest males, and the waiting begins for the first females to arrive. Once they've mated, the two herons will remain together for the whole season. The male does most of the stick gathering, while the female places the sticks and prepares the nest for her future brood. A month 
later, in mid-April. I think I can hear the newborn chicks, but I'm not sure. The angle doesn't give a good view into the nest. I wait a few more days before deciding they've probably hatched. The best way I can find out is to climb the tree. My two herons live in a stand of sycamore trees in the middle of the refuge. To get up, I use ropes thrown over the branches above. After two years' practice, I can usually get to the top of one of these 120-foot sycamores in about a half an hour. One of the reasons so little is known about the great blues is that it's so hard to observe them. Another reason is that they're extremely wary of humans, and for good reason. We are the main threat to their survival. Many thoughtless hunters consider them fair game, even here in the wildlife refuge. And as we build more and more houses, we take their land and drive them away. The great blues always build their nests on the weakest and least accessible limbs to protect them from any predators coming up the tree. Well, I was wrong. They haven't hatched yet. I'll come back tomorrow. They're born with their eyes open, but almost helpless. My heron family is a typical size. At birth, they have just a sparse down insulation, which makes them vulnerable to any cold weather. Three days later, an April snowstorm hits our refuge. Yesterday's storm took its toll, and all my nestlings died. Now the parents have to start over again. May and June, I continue to check the nest from time to time. All of the nestlings are doing fine, except the last one hatched, <laughs> the rent. Weak from the start, he hasn't been getting his share of the food. Usually in nature, the weak do not survive, only the strong. But in this case, nature made an exception, and the rent lived. By mid-June, the nestlings are trying out their wings in the nest. The parents begin to feed the young less often, encouraging them to feed on their own. The aggressiveness of the young at mealtime now makes feeding by mouth more and more difficult. So the parents just drop the food in the nest. This period when the nestlings are learning to fly it's particularly dangerous for them, and their mother knows it. Graceful as they are, even the adult great blues have difficulty maintaining their balance in the trees. Even in light breezes, these creatures will occasionally miscalculate landings. If a fledgling falls from the nest and lives, 
The adult herons won't risk going to the ground to feed and care for it. The forest floor has too many predators. The fledgling must fly or die. In their first year of life, about 70% of the fledglings die. But life goes on, and the young fledglings continue to practice flying in the nest and on nearby branches. By early July, after two months of nest life, the fledglings are ready for flight. Soon the young herons will make their first flight south. When they return, if they survive, I'll be returning too to study them. <laughs> <laughs>